Geographic information systems are computerized systems designed for the storage, retrieval, and analysis of geographically referenced data. GIS uses advanced analytical tools to explore the spatial relationships, patterns, and processes of cultural, biological, demographic, economic, geographic, and physical phenomena. There's a lot of stuff there. And all of those items that have in common is spatial relationship, spatial context. Anything that has a spatial context associated with it, we can use GIS to study it. So GIS is a computer software. Google Earth, for example, can be considered a nice GIS, simple but nice GIS software package. When we explore further in this course, we'll explore ArcGIS. And ArcGIS is produced by a company called ESRI, Environmental Systems Research Institute. They're the number one producers of GIS software in the industry, but there's other software packages that we'll explore as well. GIS is a collection of computer hardware. It's a service that can be distributed and accessed via the internet. It's a tool. And then finally, GIS is a system and a science. And I really, really want to highlight the term science. There is so much behind GIS today. The tools of GIS and the tools of geospatial technology really lends itself to be a science unto itself. And the beauty of this science is you can have specific GIS technicians and GIS users, but then you can also have ancillary users. For example, someone who is in business will use GIS as a tool for their business. Someone who is in politics will use GIS. Someone who is in the physical sciences will use GIS. So GIS can be used to study all of these different problems across all of these different fields and genres. You know, we talk about tools. What's really cool is the tools today are really different than maybe the tools a decade ago. Of course, we still use computers. But the computers today are so much more powerful, so much faster, and have so much more memory than the computers a decade ago, it really has revolutionized the entire genre of geospatial analysis. Other tools are the digitizer, scanner, printer, plotter, GPS units, and now, of course, we see tablets. And with tablets running GIS software, we've really brought a mobility to the science that we didn't have just a handful of years ago. As far as software goes, there's a variety of different types of GIS software. There's desktop GIS software, such as ArcGIS desktop version. There's internet-based GIS, such as ArcGIS Online, Google Earth, and other products. And of course, there's CAD software, computer-assisted drafting and design. But more importantly than the hardware or the software are people. People are really the mainstay of GIS. People collaborating together, sharing information, sharing data, putting it all together in the quest to solve problems. I'd like to show you another short video. This one is a interview with Richard Feynman, Nobel Laureate of Physics in 1965, discussing knowing something versus knowing the name of something. Again, for those of you following along in the PDF version of this lecture, please click on this link below in order to access the interview directly from YouTube. All the kids were playing in the field, and uh, one kid said to me, uh, See that bird? What kind of a bird is that? And I said, uh, I haven't the slightest idea what kind of a bird it is. He says, It's a brown throated, throated thrush or something. He says, Your father doesn't tell you anything. But it was the opposite. My father had taught me, looking at a bird, he says, do you know what that bird is? It's a brown-throated thrush. But in Portuguese, it's a hontarapero. In Italian, a chuterapitita. He says, in Chinese, it's a chungongpa. In Japanese, a patara tokodacha, etc. He says, now you know all the languages you want to know what the name of that bird is. And when you finish with all that, he says, you'll know absolutely nothing whatever about the bird. You only know about humans in different places and what they call the bird. Now, he says, let's look at the bird and what it's doing. He knew the difference between knowing the name of something and knowing something. 
Now, I understand that Richard Feynman was not specifically talking about geographic information systems. Nevertheless, the premise is true. Knowing something versus knowing the name of something. We need to remember this because as we proceed through this class and we start to really study and get our hands dirty with geospatial technology, you need to know that we're not just making maps. We're not just putting a tree on the map and saying, hey, the oak tree is over there, for example. We are trying our best to gather a lot of information about something and solve a problem. So let's take a look at geographic information systems. With GIS, we can describe any element of our world in two ways. The first way, of course, is simply location. Where is it? So in my example, I have an oak tree. We put it on the map. Voila, we know where it is. But with GIS, we can also add attribute information. What is it? So this is an oak tree. The height is 15 meters and the age is 75 years old. We're no longer dealing with static maps. We're no longer looking at a map and something's on the map and maybe it's labeled. Now what we have is something on the map that we can actually query and find out more information about it. And then once we have that on the map, we can add other information to the map. For example, weather data, soil data, geologic information, wind patterns. Every element that we can think of that we have data for, we can put on the map. And then we can start to seek relationship between these different variables that are on the map together. Let me give you a quick example. We can go to ArcGIS Online. And here's ArcGIS Online and I have a vineyards project up. And what you see here is a map of the world. Now I've got a number of layers as well that I could add to this map. Let's add vineyards. So now these red dots pop up and what you see are vineyards of the world. And we can click on a vineyard and the information regarding that vineyard is going to pop up, giving us the name of the vineyard as well as its latitude and longitude. Well, let's say that we wanted to see whether or not all of these vineyards had something in common. So we can take a look at soils. So here's our European soils and we'll put that on the map and we'll zoom into that area so that you can see it a little bit further. And there are the vineyards. Now when we click on a soil pattern, we get that information as well. So we're going to get all of the information regarding that soil. Now these are European vineyards. What if we wanted to look at vineyards, for example, in the United States of America and we wanted to compare soils? Well, we can click on the soils of the United States map and let's go to the United States. And we'll fly ourselves right to it. So here's the United States and we'll wait for those soils to pop up. And here they are and when they do, we can query these soils now. And now we have a comparison. So I can take a look at different vineyards in the United States of America and compare those vineyards to Europe. I can of course do the same with South American soils. So let's go to South America and compare those vineyards in South America as well. So here are the South American vineyards and here are the soils and again we can click on those soils and figure out if indeed we have a pattern or a relationship between soils and vineyards. Of course we know that we're growing grapes it's not just the soils precipitation matters. So now we can take a look at global precipitation patterns and see whether or not there's a relationship between these different locations their soils and precipitation. Of course we're not done yet. All of these different places have unique ecosystems potentially as well. So now we can do an ecoregion map of the world. And once again we can see whether or not the variables match from place to place. Now if we're really smart we can make a model. And in our model we can weight things or weight items. So let's say I'm really knowledgeable about growing grapes. And let's say water moisture accounts for 40 percent of good growth and maybe a certain type of soil accounts for 20 percent of good growth and maybe the aspect the direction with which the vineyard is pointing relative to the sun 
also plays a big role, maybe 10, 20%. We can make a model and weight all of these different variables together and then try to come up with our best location to grow another vineyard. Once again, when we're talking about GIS, Geographic Information Systems, we're no longer talking about a static map, but rather we're talking about a dynamic map. GIS, because of this, has really unique capabilities. We're able to answer questions about where and when and why. GIS is going to store the coordinates of graphic features and other attributes as map layers. And these map layers can then be reused easily and assembled into any number of map compositions to answer any number of questions. In the example we have up here, we have a series of layers. We have a watershed map, for example, a map of slope, a map of soil, a map of land use, and a map of animal loading. And we can put all of these different layers together to try to come up with a solution for an agricultural pollution potential. So once again, we're taking variables of information, we're combining it together, and from that, we're trying to analyze something or solve a problem. So what are the major questions then for a GIS? Well, there's the what question. What exists at a certain location? Where are certain conditions satisfied? What has changed in a place over time? What spatial patterns exist? And what if this condition occurred at this place? You know, I have a number of examples listed here. And what I'm going to do is go through them relatively quickly. And I'll ask you to review the PDF file in your own leisure to explore these examples a little bit further. But in any GIS we undertake, we're really looking at two things. The first thing is the question. The question of where, when, why, how, what. So in this example, regarding fire management, the question becomes where are areas of high fire hazard? Once we have the question, we then look at the variables that could feed the question. So when we're seeking high fire hazard, the variables that we're looking at are, for example, potential ignition sources, power lines, roads, industrial areas, housing areas. We're also looking at factors such as vegetation types, slope, aspect, natural or man-made barriers, and historical weather patterns. We can take all of this information and integrate it into predictive models. And once the predictive models run, the end game is going to be a map which shows high risk fire area. We can then take that information and maybe go in and remove dead brush. We could also figure out where the best locations for fire stations are, fire stations are supposed to be. So again, we ask the question, then we ask what do we need to solve the problem? Agriculture, what's the question? How can I improve food production? What are the map layers needed to try to solve that problem? Healthcare. In this example, the question was, what communities are at risk from disease? What are the map layers needed? And the example that I have up here on the screen is a Guatemalan epidemic of river blindness disease. As it turns out, a few years ago in Guatemala, there was this epidemic. Mosquitoes were the carriers of the disease. Health officials were able to use GIS to map out the area and they plotted the location of the mosquito breeding sites. Communities surrounding the sites were then assessed to determine their chances of getting affected by the disease. As a result, they were able to manage the healthcare treatment facilities much, much more effectively. Superstorm Sandy mashup. You know, by the way, the term mashup refers to a community project. So when we talk about Superstorm Sandy, after the storm, the question becomes, where are there food shortages? Where should we put mobile food sites? The community then came out and said, this area needs help. This area needs help. Everybody contributed and all of this information got purged um, into Google, Google Maps. And once the Google Map was made, it was really easy, or easier I should say, to have an emergency management system. So where are the mobile food sites? What are the map layers needed? Marketing. Again, the question becomes, how can I optimize my marketing campaign? What are the map layers needed? Real estate. Where is my dream home? 
what are the map layers? Of course, everybody's dream home needs to be subdued a little bit by your maximum amount of money that you can pay. But beyond that, you can look for houses of a certain size. You can look for houses in a certain community with relationship to school districts, for example, or crime. There's a variety of variables that one can look at to determine the best location to buy your home. You know, these have all been pretty good examples of GIS in action. But let's go back to 1854 and explore one of the very first examples of GIS and spatial analysis. Sit back and enjoy the 10 minute discussion of Stephen Johnson's Ghost Map. Again, for those of you following along in the PDF version of this lecture, you can access the discussion directly by clicking on this link below. Uh, what I want to do is, is take you back uh, to 1854 in London uh, for the next few minutes and, and tell the story uh, in brief of this, of this outbreak, um, which in many ways I think helped create the world that we live in today and, and, and particularly the kind of city that we live in today. This period in, in 1854 in, in, in the you know, middle part of the 19th century in London's history is incredibly interesting um, for a number of reasons, but I think the most important one is that London was a city of two and a half million people, and it was the largest city that it, that on the, on the face of the planet at that point, but it was also the largest city that had ever been built. And so the Victorians were trying to kind of live through and, and simultaneously invent a whole new scale of living, the scale of living that we you know now call metropolitan living. Um, and it was in many ways at this point in the mid-1850s a complete disaster. Um, they were basically a city living with a modern kind of industrial metropolis with an Elizabethan public infrastructure. Um, so people, for instance, just to gross you out for a second, uh, had, had cesspools of human waste in their basement, uh, like a foot to two feet deep. Um, and they would just kind of throw the buckets down there uh, and hope that it would somehow go away. And of course, it never really would go away. Um, and all of this stuff basically had, had accumulated to the point where the city was in incredibly offensive to just walk around in. It was an amazingly smelly city, um, not just because of the cesspools, but also the, the sheer number of livestock in the city would shock people, not just the horses, but people had cows in their attics that they would use for milk that they would kind of hoist up there and keep them in the attic until, until literally their milk went out and they died, and then they would kind of drag them off uh, to the you know, the bone boilers down the street. Um, so uh, you would just walk around London at this point and just be overwhelmed with this, with this stench. And what ended up happening is that an entire kind of emerging public health system became convinced that it was the smell that was, that was killing everybody, that was creating these diseases that would kind of wipe through the city every three or four years. And cholera was really the great killer of this period. It had arrived in London in 1832. And every four or five years, another epidemic would take 10,000, 20,000 people in, in London and, and throughout the UK. And so the authorities became convinced that this, this smell was this problem. We had to get rid of the smell. Um, and so, in fact, they, they concocted a couple of early, you know, kind of founding public health interventions in the system of the city, um, one of which was called the Nuisances Act, which they got everybody, as far as they could, to empty out their cesspools and uh, just pour all that waste into the river. Because if we get it out of the streets, it'll smell much better. And, oh, right, we drink from the river. Um, so what ended up happening, actually, is, is they ended up increasing the outbreaks of cholera because, as we now know, cholera is actually in the water. It's a waterborne disease, not something that's in the air. It's not something you smell or inhale. It's something you ingest. And so the, one of the founding moments of kind of public health in, in the 19th century effectively poisoned the water supply of London much more effectively than any modern day bioterrorist could have ever dreamed of doing. So at, at this, this was kind of the state of London in 1854. And in, in the middle of all this kind of carnage and uh, offensive conditions, and, and in the midst of all this kind of scientific confusion about what was actually killing people, there was a very uh, you know, talented classic 19th century uh, multidisciplinarian named John Snow who was a local doctor in, in Soho in London, who had been arguing for about four or five years that cholera was in fact a waterborne disease and had basically convinced nobody of this. Um, the public health authorities had largely ignored what he had to say. And 
he'd made the case in a number of papers and done a number of studies, um, but nothing had really kind of stuck. And part of the, what's so interesting about this story to me is, is that in some ways it's a great case study in how cultural change happens, how a good idea eventually comes to win out over, over much worse ideas. Um, and Snow labored for a long time with this great insight that everybody kind of ignored. And then on one day, August 28th of, of 1854, a young child, a five-month-old girl, whose, whose first name we don't know, we know her only as Baby Lewis, um, somehow contracted cholera, came down with cholera at 40 Broad Street. You can't really see it in this, in this map, but this is, this is the map that becomes the central kind of focus in, in the second half of my book. So in the middle of Soho, in this working-class neighborhood, this little girl becomes sick, and it turns out that the cesspool that they still continue to have, despite the Nuisances Act, uh, bordered on an extremely popular uh, water pump, local watering hole, that was well known for the best water in all of Soho, that all the residents from Soho and the surrounding neighborhoods would go to. And so this little girl inadvertently ended up contaminating the water in this popular pump. And one of the most terrifying outbreaks in the history of, uh, of England erupted about two or three days later. Literally 10% of the neighborhood died in, in seven days, and much more would have died if people hadn't fled after the, after the initial kind of outbreak kind of kicked in. Um, so it was this incredibly terrifying event. You had these scenes of entire families dying over the course of 48 hours of cholera alone in their one-room apartments, um, in their little flats. Um, just an, an extraordinary, terrifying scene. Snow lived near there heard about the outbreak, and in this amazing kind of act of courage, went directly into the belly of the beast, because he thought an outbreak that concentrated could actually potentially end up convincing people that, in fact, the, the, the real menace of, of cholera was, was in the water supply and, and not in the air. He suspected an outbreak that concentrated would probably involve a single point source, one single thing that, that everybody was going to because it didn't have the kind of the, the traditional slower path of kind of infections that, that you might expect. And so he went right in there and, and, and started interviewing people. He eventually enlisted the, the help kind of, of, of this amazing other figure who's kind of the other protagonist of the book, this guy Henry Whitehead, who was a local minister, who was not at all a man of science, but it was incredibly socially connected. He knew everybody in the neighborhood. And he managed to track down, Whitehead did, many of the cases of people who had drunk water from the pump or who hadn't drunk water from the pump. And eventually Snow made a, a map of the outbreak. He, he found increasingly that people who drank from the pump were getting sick, people who hadn't drunk from the pump were not getting sick. And he thought about kind of representing that as a kind of a table of statistics of people living in different neighborhoods, people who hadn't, you know, percentages of people who hadn't. But eventually he hit upon the idea that what he needed was something that you could see, something that would take, in a sense, a higher level view of all this activity that had been happening in the neighborhood. And so he created this, this map, um, which basically ended up representing all the deaths in the neighborhoods as black bars at each address. And you can see in this map the pump right at the center of it, you can see that one of the residents down the way had about 15 people dead. Um, and as you, the map is actually a little bit bigger. As you get further and further away from the pump, the, the deaths begin to uh, grow less and less frequent. And so you can see this kind of something poisonous kind of emanating out of this pump that you could see in a glance. And so with the help of this map and with the help of kind of more kind of evangelizing that he did over the, over the next few years and that Whitehead did, Eventually, actually, the authorities slowly started to come around. It took much longer than sometimes uh, we like to think in this story. But by 1866, when the next big cholera outbreak came to London, the authorities had been convinced, in, in part because of this story, in part because of this map, um, that in fact the water was the problem. And they had already started building the sewers in London. And they immediately went to this outbreak and they told everybody to start boiling their water. And that was the last time that London has seen a cholera outbreak since. So part of this story, I think, well, it's a terrifying story, it's a very dark story, and it's a story that continues on in many of the developing cities of the, the world. It's also a story, really, that is fundamentally optimistic, which is to say that it's possible to solve these problems if we listen to reason, if we listen to the kind of wisdom of these kinds of maps, if we listen to people like Snow and Whitehead, if we listen to the locals who understand what's going on in, in these kinds of situations. And what it ended up doing is making the idea of large-scale metropolitan living a sustainable one. When people were looking at 10% of their neighborhoods dying in the space of seven days, 
there was a, a widespread consensus that this couldn't go on, that people weren't meant to live in cities of two and a half million people. But because of what Snow did, because of this map, because of the whole series of kind of reforms that happened in the wake of this map, we now take for granted that cities of 10 million people, cities like this one, are in fact sustainable things. We don't worry that New York City is going to collapse in on itself quite the way that you know, Rome did and be 10% of its size in 100 years or 200 years. And so that, in a, in a way, is the ultimate legacy of this map. It's, it's, a, it's a map of deaths that ended up creating a whole new way of life, the life that, that we're enjoying here today. Thank you very much. You know, Dr. John Snow's London street map of the cholera outbreak of 1854 really proved itself to be a, a good example of spatial analysis and mapping and how these techniques and technology can be used to solve problems. Of course, back then, there were no fast computers with fast processors and lots of memory to download data. Today, we do. And with the advent of the computer in the 1960s, this whole idea of spatial analysis and mapping and geographic information systems really took off. Then in the early 1970s, new satellites such as Landsat began monitoring the surface and atmosphere and started generating huge amounts of data for analysis, which also subsequently continued to spur further development of GIS techniques, mapping software, and analytical software as well. In the late 1970s and early 1980s, we begin to see this nice push for integrated software in publicly and commercially available packages. So now the users became people like me and you, not just academics and not just professionals. Currently, there's a real big push towards open source GIS platforms. That means the free stuff. So again, we now have this ability where GIS can be pushed across the entire spectrum of users. Geospatial technologies, industries, and applications are across virtually any spatial genre. So wherever spatial data analysis is needed, geospatial technology is there. Whether it's in business, for site location, delivery systems, and marketing, government, local, state, federal, and military, economic development, such as population studies, emergency services, such as fire, police, and first responders, environmental studies, including monitoring and modeling, industries such as transportation, communication, mining, pipelines, healthcare, public health, urban planning, land use, historic studies, housing studies, criminology, politics, elections and reappointments, and certainly education, research used as a teaching tool, and certainly in the administration of educational institutions as well. Again, wherever spatial data analysis is needed, geospatial technology is there. Geospatial technology is considered a Department of Labor high growth industry. And I encourage you all to check out two websites. One of them is careervoyages.gov. And when you go to careervoyages.gov, you can explore in-demand careers. One of them will be geospatial technology. And when you visit the site, there's an industry overview and the in-demand occupations, and it tells you what jobs are available in the industry. In addition to that website, visit the Department of Labor site. And there you can read about how geospatial technology is a high growth industry and what the future outlook for the industry is as well. Because of the growth of the geospatial technology industry, there was a real need to develop a competency model for geospatial technology. A competency model is a collection of competencies that together define successful performance in a particular work setting. The model serves as a resource for career guidance, curriculum development and evaluation, career pathway development, recruitment and hiring, continuing professional development, certification and assessment development, apprenticeship program development, and outreach efforts to promote geospatial technology careers. Specifically, the geospatial technology competency model has been developed by researching and analyzing publicly available resources, existing skill standards, 
competency-based curricula and certifications to provide an employer-driven framework of the skills needed for success in geospatial technology. Our course curriculum for this class is based upon the GTCM. Now, what is the GTCM and what does it include? Well, you can actually click on this link that we have here and it'll take you straight to the careeronestop.org website. And when you get to the website, you can see that you can view an industry model. And there are 22 models listed here, one of them being geospatial technology. So we click on that and it takes you right to the GTCM. And when you get to the GTCM, you notice the GTCM pyramid. And let's say that you are interested in knowing what the industry-wide technical competencies are for this industry. Well, you can click on this part of the pyramid. And from that, you're given the core geospatial abilities and knowledge. So you have critical work functions. And they involve earth geometry and geodesy, for example, data quality, satellite positioning and other measurement systems, remote sensing and photogrammetry, cartography, GIS, programming application development and geospatial information technology, and professionalism. And then along with those cores, you have technical content areas as well. Now, as you go through this GTCM and all of the core competencies associated with it, take a look at our outline for our course. Because the outline for our course is going to mimic quite a bit the GTCM. We are going to make ourselves aware of those fundamental core concepts in the geospatial technology industry. So let me give you a quick summary and some additional thoughts. First of all, geospatial technology, when done right, can help us save time, money, and lives. We saw this going all the way back to 1854 with Dr. John Snow's cholera map of London. We also see that today with emergency responders and first responders. In addition, the geospatial industry is rapidly growing. Geospatial is both an industry and an ancillary tool for spatial disciplines, such as political science or criminology or real estate or business or physical sciences or any field that has a spatial component associated to it. We also see that geospatial technology is shifting from a closed, centralized GIS architecture to an open, distributed geospatial information services framework for all to use. The field is much more than learning software and pressing buttons. It includes analysis, spatial awareness, pattern recognition, and critical thinking. This is going to be a fun journey. When we get back for our next lecture, we're going to start to explore the real fundamentals of maps and map making. And the question we're going to ask ourselves is, how can you take a three-dimensional world that we live on and put it on a two-dimensional plane, i.e. a map that we can study? We'll talk about that next time.